Just giving a one minute warning. Please take a seat. Well, good afternoon, and can I welcome you to this? Bonjour, bienvenue à cette deuxième réunion de la PP. C'est avec plaisir que je vous accueille à Westminster. Bonjour. The delegation from the European Parliament, and uh, many of you will know this room, a familiar setting for leadership contest announcements. And uh, I'm standing in the or oh, sitting in the very place that Sir Graham Brady uh, stands up and announces who won. Uh, it's also where uh, each week the uh, Labour Party has its meeting with all the Labour Party uh, on Mondays and the Conservatives, uh, we have ours on Wednesday. So it's a, it's a room with a long history. But um, I thought we had some very fruitful and worthwhile discussions during our first meeting in Brussels, and I hope that pattern will remain for our meeting today. We've got a lot to do, but I'd like to... Uh, hand over to my fellow chair for um, uh, a few words of welcome, Natalie. Well, um, my first uh, words will be in English because it's such a pleasure for me and the delegation of uh, members of the European Parliament coming with me to be here in Westminster and to be uh, back in the uh, Parliamentary Partnership Assembly. Uh, thank you for welcoming us. Uh, we are really thrilled because it's the first official delegation of members of the European Parliament coming to London after Brexit. Can we realize that? I think it was about time. Uh, so thank you very much for welcoming us. Um, you know um, how committed the European Parliament is to the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly. Um, we look forward to our exchanges. We know from experience of the first meeting in Brussels, that there will be uh, positive, that there will be rich, uh, and what will take place today and tomorrow will certainly participate in a, a positive spirit of enhancing our partnership. We have an ambitious program, an ambitious agenda, and I am certain that we will have a, a, a wide debate, sometimes a lively debate, but certainly a fruitful debate. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I hand back the floor to Sir Oliver. Well, we're very lucky today to have a very special guest to open our meeting, uh, Lord McFall, the Lord Speaker. Uh, we're delighted that you can join us, and thank you very much for being here with us today. Uh, the floor is yours for some opening words. Th thank you, Oliver and Natalie. And it is a real pleasure for me to be here to open this session. And can I welcome all members of the European Parliament to Westminster. But before we start today, let us pause to reflect on the contribution President Sassoli made, the late President Sassoli. He was an inspiring parliamentarian and colleague, and he played a huge role in the development of the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly. But due to his and other efforts, the Assembly has grown from a mere line in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement into a vibrant and hard-working body, now meeting for the second time. It is an enduring and powerful part of his legacy that we see around us today. This is a period where a new relationship is still taking place. The UK and U European Parliaments have key roles as architects of their own structure for coming together and providing democratic oversight of very significant issues. The first step in that process was the first meeting of the PPA in May, and the UK delegation were warmly welcomed to Brussels by President Metzler as she opened that meeting. Today, it's my privilege then to greet you all and extend that warm welcome to the Palace of Westminster. I also pay a special welcome to the observers present. We are very pleased to have representatives of the Welsh Shannad, the Scottish Parliament, and the Northern Ireland Assembly 
as well as the Committee of the Regions and the Economic and Social Committee with us today. The Bureau has worked hard behind the scenes to find innovative ways for observers to be able to share their voice. And the PPA is about bringing democratic perspectives to our current challenges, and those perspectives are richer for our colleagues' contributions. One of my personal priorities as Lord Speaker has been to strengthen the relationships between the House of Lords and all of the other legislators within the United Kingdom with an emphasis on mutual respect and cooperation. And I'm delighted to see the PPA as one of many ways that we are putting that aspiration into reality. Having visited the Scottish Parliament, the, the Welsh Government, uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly, and two weeks ago uh, in Dublin to address the Shannad, my themes have been twin, friendship and engagement. That is the only way that we will tackle the multi-problems which address us today. The PPA's first meeting agreed your rules of procedure all in one go, which is an impressive feat for a new assembly. It has allowed the PPA to focus all in immediately on the issues of real concern. The second meeting will consider for the first time a draft resolution of the PPA on energy cooperation. Should the PPA agree to a resolution, it will be using its full voice for the first time. It is a voice that brings together parliamentarians in a unique way, and those of all those we represent and serve on such a critical set of issues. A resolution of the PPA embodies consensus between diverse parliamentarians and a strong message to the Partnership Council. It is a voice that cannot be ignored. And Oliver, I would only take one exception with your speech when you mentioned a return match. Let's forget about return matches and work in a very cooperative uh, way for the future. So no notion of that. And with that in mind, I hope you have a productive and enjoyable session over the next couple of days, and thank you for the welcome. Well, John, thank you very much for your kind words and best wishes, and I fully take the point about matches. <laughs> and, and, and as you, you, you may remember, uh, over many years, you and I have cooperated together without exactly. having a football match, so thank you very much. <laughs> Um, we're sorry you can't uh, manage to join us for the dinner tonight, but we are grateful to you for giving up your time to open the meeting, and I'm sure there'll be another opportunity to do something social in future. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Thank you. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to remind the Assembly that the meeting is public and the proceedings are being web-streamed on the UK Parliament's YouTube channel. Uh, we've also got interpretation and um, number two is in English and number three is in French. Uh, I'd also uh, like to remind people in line with the Speaker's uh, uh, rules that the UK Parliament has a behaviour code which applies to everyone members, staff and visitors alike. Courtesy to all is the rule. And uh, I'd be very happy now to hand over to Natalie Loiseau for the first item. Thank you, Oliver. Um, and because I cannot resist the pleasure of having uh, French language being heard in Westminster, <laughs> and because you need to uh, try your headphones and see if it works, <laughs> uh, I will switch to my mother tongue. Um, chers collègues, nous avons un certain nombre de questions importantes à débattre aujourd'hui et demain qui sont au cœur des relations entre l'Union européenne et le Royaume-Uni. Cet après-midi, nous commencerons par l'adoption du procès verbal de notre première réunion qui s'est tenue à Bruxelles. Et Minutes of the first uh, meeting that took place in Brussels on the 13th of May. We will then start with an exchange of views uh, with the progress uh, of that has been made in the uh, partnership uh, in the APP. 
The following point on the agenda concerns energy cooperation. This is a very topical uh, issue and we would like to adopt a uh, recommendation on this resolution for the Partnership Council. At 4 p.m. we will take a break and then we'll prepare for the uh, breakout groups and then tomorrow we will hear the feedbacks of the uh, people chairing the breakout groups and then we're going to have an exchange of views on the future of Europe and the UK and then on cooperation between the PPA and civil society between the assembly and the decentralized uh, assemblies of the UK and we will hear the representatives of the uh, Committee of the Regions and the EESC and the Decentralised Assemblies, um, Devolved Assemblies. We will then talk about the future work of our Assembly. The draft agenda has been handed out to both delegations. If there are no comments, and I know that that note that that doesn't seem to be the case, the agenda, agenda will be considered adopted. I will now give the floor back to Sir Oliver to present the next uh, point on the agenda. Thank you, Natalie. On the 12th and 13th of May have been circulated. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the item about information from the Partnership Council. Um, as instructed by the plenary, Natalie and I wrote a joint letter to the Partnership Council on this subject, and their response has been circulated to all members of both delegations. I think it's fair to say we were slightly disappointed at the time taken to receive the response and uh, I hope this will improve in future. Um, are there any questions on the minutes? Um, may we therefore consider the minutes agreed? Nobody against? Um, if, as there's no objection, thank you very much, and I hand the floor to Natalie to introduce the next item on the agenda, and our speakers will be coming up to the, uh, uh, the uh, table here. The next point on our agenda concerns the state of play of the uh, Partnership Council and we will now hear our guests speak about the last development, latest developments within the Partnership Council. We have the pleasure of welcoming Leo Doherty, uh, Minister for Europe in the United Kingdom and Marov Cevcevic. Vice President of the European Commission, uh, responsible for interinstitutional relations and perspectives. Welcome him as well. I will now give them the floor, one and then the other, and after their presentations, we will have an exchange of views with them. On a personal level, I'd just like to add that we would all like to see our relationships improve and be reinforced. We would like to work closer and more, ever more closely together. And I will now give the floor to Mr. Doherty. Ah, Madam, thank you so much indeed for the opportunity uh, to address uh, you, and thank you, Mr. Oliver, for. Uh, presiding, and uh, I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity to speak to you all. As our parliaments come together today in friendship, we have a sobering reminder, ladies and gentlemen, elsewhere in Europe, that freedom and democracy can never be taken for granted. Vladimir Putin's Ill Ill illegal invasion of Ukraine is now in its 257th day. That is 257 days of unprovoked violence, 257 days of death and 257 days of Vladimir Putin threatening Ukraine's right to exist. So we must never forget that we have much more in common than that which divides us. And that we are stronger when we stand together, when we find solutions and move forward in common cause. The United Kingdom wants a positive relationship with the European Union. Of course, Brexit was never about the UK stepping away from our proud and historic role in Europe. For example, 44 countries, including the UK, came together to seek common ground at the first summit of the European political community in Prague last month. 
and the United Kingdom remains a founding member of the Council of Europe. We fully support the work and aims of the Council, which brings together both EU and non-EU states to support human rights and democracy in Europe. And of course, this PPA assembly provides an opportunity to exchange ideas about how we get the most out of the UK-EU relationship for the benefit of our people and businesses. Firstly, I'd like to make some remarks about Ukraine. A clear lesson from the last nine months has been that despite the challenges of our relationship, the UK and EU are effective allies where it matters most. My priority as Minister for Europe is to continue to strengthen our cooperation where it is in our mutual interest. The Ukrainians have stood firm against Vladimir Putin, in part because of the actions of our government and those across the European Union. That action has been stronger because it has been coordinated between us. We have worked with the EU, including through the G7, on the most robust packages of sanctions in history. We have helped Sweden and Finland accede to NATO, which remains the bedrock of our collective defence. And our militaries have worked together through the Joint Expeditionary Force and training for Ukrainian soldiers. We have shared expertise with the soon-to-be-established EU training mission, and we very much welcome its contribution. We were pleased to see the EU's eighth sanctions package agreed at the start of October and to work closely with your experts to coordinate and align it with our own measures. Of course, if Ukraine's sovereign borders are not respected, all our borders are less secure. So this is the moment to redouble our resolve. The United Kingdom is sending £2.3 billion worth of military su to support to Ukraine this year, and we will match or exceed that same amount next year. I urge our European friends to continue to work with us in providing more weapons, imposing more sanctions, and backing Ukraine to push Russian forces out. Turning now to the TCA, let me uh, make some brief remarks on the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Of course, the EU is our largest trading partner, and we are the, second, the EU's second largest. A successful trading relationship is, of course, in both of our interests, and the TCA is the world's biggest zero-tariff, zero-quota free trade agreement and includes cutting-edge provisions in sectors such as services and digital. The agreement is broadly functioning well. The TCA's committee architecture is fully operational. The specialized committees who are responsible for monitoring implementation have all met at least once, with some meeting more regularly, and all will meet again over the course of this year. The domestic advisory group and civil society forum are up and running, ensuring that we hear directly from those most affected by the TCA, and the partnership council will meet by the end of the year. To draw out a couple of recent achievements, the UK will resume participation in the North Seas Energy Cooperation Forum this year. This will accelerate the development of European renewables. And EU and UK regulators have taken the first step towards an agreement on mutual recognition of architecture qualifications. Now, whilst these developments are welcome, there are other areas where implementation of the agreement needs to be accelerated and some areas where businesses are facing avoidable barriers. UK businesses face costly burdens in order to register to take advantage of the EU's VAT processes for online sales into the EU. We wrote to the EU at the end of July 2021 outlining our concerns. The TCA provides for such an amendment if both parties agree, but the EU does not. Another issue facing us is science and research, where agreement is in our mutual interests and of pressing concern. The EU has not fulfilled the agreement reached under the TCA for the UK to participate in EU programmes, including Horizon Europe. UK scientists and researchers should already be part of these programmes, but the EU has persistently delayed our participation over the last 16 months. We would all benefit from the UK's participation, and it brings no conceivable disadvantage to the EU or its member states. But the EU has 
politicised scientific cooperation by linking it with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Putting politics in the way of scientific collaboration constrains human potential and hurts everybody. In response to the UK's refusal to adhere to their obligations, the UK launched formal consultations under the TCA's dispute settlement provisions. The UK cannot wait much longer. The EU's approach is causing unacceptable uncertainty for our research and our business communities. The UK government will continue to support our cutting edge research and development sector. We have already outlined options for doing so, and this is under active consideration. We urge the EU to reconsider its approach. Turning now to energy cooperation. Of course, energy security and supply are on your agenda, so I want to make some brief remarks. We face a common challenge with high energy prices, insecure supply, and the need to move away from Russian hydrocarbons. Putin seeks to divide us by making us squabble over energy. The UK and the EU are working together to ensure EU gas storage is on track for the winter. And under the TCA, we discussed winter preparedness and security of supply at the Specialised Committee on Energy on the 28th of September. But we must accelerate delivery of the TCA's provisions on electricity trading. These arrangements will make electricity more affordable, support security of supply, and help integrate low-carbon technologies into the grid. However, the timeline originally set out in the treaty has not been met. The UK has set out its significant concerns about these delays through the Specialised Committee on Energy and continues to call for more progress on this issue. Turning now to citizens' rights. Now, of course, this is contained in the withdrawal agreement rather than in the TCA, and it, it is something that I know is of uh, great interest to the Assembly. The UK hugely values the contribution of EU citizens who have chose, chosen to make the UK their home. Our implementation of the withdrawal agreement through the EU settlement scheme has been a success. As of the 30th of June, almost 6.7 million applications had been received, with nearly 96% of these concluded. We appreciate the efforts made by the Commission and Member States to support UK nationals in the EU. And we will continue to raise concerns on behalf of UK nationals in line with, with the withdrawal agreement framework. And I urge the Commission to take urgent action with Member States to resolve them. Turning now to the Northern Ireland Protocol. I know at the Assembly's first meeting you discussed the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol and delegates called for the UK and the EU to work together to find a solution. It is clear that the Protocol has caused real problems in Northern Ireland, including trade disruption and diversion, and it has inflicted significant costs and bureaucracy on businesses. At the same time, people in Northern Ireland have been deprived of equal treatment with people in the rest of the UK on matters such as VAT and subsidies and the right to vote on the laws that apply to them. The consequence has been political turmoil. Northern Ireland is without an executive. The political settlement in Northern Ireland is based on respect between all communities and the consent of those, uh, and the consent of those communities. And, of course, the protocol is directly undermining that. So let me be clear. It is the UK's preference to resolve this through talks. Our Foreign Secretary and Vice President Shevkovich have had productive meetings and have initiated further uh, technical discussions. And, of course, we are engaging in constructive dialogue to find solutions, and the Foreign Secretary and Vice President Shevkovich will speak again very soon. In conclusion... Madam Chair, as the peace enjoyed by Europe in our lifetimes is threatened by Vladimir Putin, it is vital that parliamentarians work together in defence of our shared democratic values. Putin's illegal war of choice has united the West and united democratic Europe. Our collective response to Putin's illegal war has demonstrated that when we come together with common purpose and common goodwill and common resolve, we are a force for a better future. That is the big picture here, and we should remember it when working through our differences. I have no doubt that you will use this assembly to build on our shared goodwill and understanding. 
and I look forward very much indeed to reading the outcomes of your discussions. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Minister. I will now uh, hand the floor to Maros Shevkovich, Vice President of the Commission. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, Natalie Loazo, Honorable Chair Hill, dear Oliver, Right Honorable Minister Doherty, dear Leo, distinguished uh, Honorable members of both uh, UK and uh, European Parliament and all the assemblies and, and the committees uh, who also been invited uh, to our deliberations of today. Indeed, it's also for me a pleasure to be here in Westminster uh, today uh, for which is already the second uh, meeting of the EU-UK Parliamentary Partnership uh, Assembly. And I think we would all agree that it has been six eventful uh, months since we, uh, since we met uh, for, the, for the first time to inaugurate this assembly designed uh, to connect parliamentarians from the European Union and uh, the United Kingdom. And I think we would all agree, and I totally share the assessment uh, with Leo, that uh, uh, Europe as a whole finds itself uh, at the historical turning point. In the face of Russia's aggression against Ukraine, we need to collectively defend uh, our values, including by maintaining our joint steadfast support uh, for Ukraine. Just the newest uh, example uh, on our part, the Commission will this week propose a substantial financial package of up to 18 billion euros in total to help cover Ukraine's financing needs in 2023. And uh, this come on top of some 22 billion euros already provided uh, by the EU uh, and member states and the European uh, financial institutions so far. The strong economic headwinds with rising energy and food prices as well as inflation across Europe surely give uh, another reason for strengthening our EU-UK collaboration. As I have said on uh, numerous occasions, the European Union seeks to have a strategic, enduring and mutually beneficial partnership uh, with the United Kingdom. In full respect of our international agreements, notably the withdrawal agreement, including the Protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the Trade and uh, Cooperation Agreement. As uh, you know very well, they were not only negotiated uh, together, agreed and ratified, but they also embody trust. And it is precisely a spirit of partnership and trust that the EU seeks in its engagement with our UK counterparts across the board. And the need for this spirit is perhaps most evident when it comes to the outstanding issues around the implementation of the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland. From the very beginning, the EU has shown genuine understanding for the practical difficulties on the ground flagged to us by Northern Irish uh, stakeholders. And this has not changed. My team and I remain committed to working constructively and intensively on joint solutions as only those can create uh, the legal certainty and predictability that the people and businesses in Northern Ireland uh, need and deserve. Here I want to appreciate the contribution of my counterpart, Foreign Secretary James Cleverly, with whom we restarted uh, the EU-UK engagement uh, on, the, uh, on the joint way forward uh, at the end of September. This is important as the UK had not engaged in any meaningful discussion with us since February. I believe that our respective uh, positions are not worlds apart if we genuinely explore the EU's robust proposals aimed at simplifying and facilitating trade between East and West while ensuring no hard border between North and South on the island of Ireland. Just to give you an example, a lot has been said about the UK Green Lane versus EU's Express Lane. The issue here boils down to no checks versus minimum checks, stemming from Brexit itself, because we must acknowledge that Brexit, Brexit did fundamentally alter the trade on the island of Ireland. 
Once goods enter Northern Ireland, uh, there are no further checks whether and if so when these goods continue to the EU's single market. But I want to ensure that the movement of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland is as seamless as possible, with almost all checks and controls effectively invisible. For instance, checking electronic data while goods are sailing on a ferry from Great Britain and before they reach Northern Ireland. That is, of course, if we have a real-time and workable access to necessary IT databases together with a minimum set of necessary data available to make an analysis of the risk possible and credible. I'm convinced that where there is a will, there is a way to find these joint solutions for the benefit of people and businesses in Northern Ireland. This is surely the moment to abandon recourse to unilateral action such as Northern Ireland Protocol Bill set to disapply the core elements of the protocol. If this bill were to become a law, the UK government would put Northern Ireland's unique access to the EU market of 450 million consumers at risk. Is the UK government truly prepared to deprive Northern Ireland of this opportunity? On top of it, unilaterally disapplying core parts of the protocol would also have serious consequences for our trade relationship under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement due to its fundamental link with the withdrawal agreement. I've already mentioned uh, today's uh, challenging times marked by soaring energy prices and high cost of living. Any additional or persistent uncertainty is not going to help. Instead, Northern Ireland uh, could and should be fully exploiting its unique position of having access to both the UK's internal and EU's single market, uh, what I would describe as the best of two worlds, a magnet for business opportunities and foreign investment. Moreover, in a couple of months, we will mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. While appreciating the achievements of the past 25 years in terms of peace in Northern Ireland, I wish we could jointly look ahead and make the next 25 years about both peace and prosperity there. All this should galvanize us into resolute action during what I see as a clear window of opportunity. For my part, I will do my utmost to exploit it, also given the EU's unwavering commitment to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. This landmark agreement remains the bedrock of our action with the protocol protecting the hard-earned gains of the peace process in Northern Ireland. After all, the European Union is at heart a peace project itself. Turning to the trade and cooperation agreement which forms a good basis for a strategic relationship. I'm glad to say that uh, its nearly two-year implementation is going well. Practically, all institutional arrangements required by the TCA are in place. Meetings of most of the committees have already taken place this year, with some still to take place this November and December. The EU domestic advisory group, consisting of NGOs, uh, business and employers organization, as well as trade unions from across the EU, has met several times to discuss the implementation of the agreement. The Civil Society Forum bringing together various civil society actors from both the EU and UK has also met uh, for the first time. On substance, uh, we have been closely following the implementation of the entire agreement, from law enforcement and judicial cooperation to fisheries and energy. Monitoring the commitments related to level playing field has required particular attention. I think it's uh, uh, worthwhile underlining once again that the trade and cooperation agreement is not and can never be a replacement uh, for EU membership. Leaving both the single market and the customs union has consequences. As a result, trade is no longer as frictionless and, uh, and uh, as dynamic as before resulting in additional cost for both 
UK and EU businesses. This new reality may be regretted, but needs to be accepted. Looking ahead, the UK is entitled to diverge uh, from the EU if it wishes to do so. But more divergence will carry even more costs and will further deepen the barriers to trade between the EU and the UK. As I have said uh, before, more divergence also means more friction and less trade. It's simple as that. And again, this in times of severe economic strains. Having said that, uh, I believe that we have a mutual interest in the trade and cooperation agreement working well for our mutual benefit. After all, the European Union is the UK's biggest trading partner, while the UK Kingdom is the EU's, in my papers, it's a third biggest trading partner, but I'm very happy to compare with the Leo our statistics. Honorable chairs, dear minister, distinguished members, last October, we saw an uh, uh, inaugural meeting of the European political community that brought together leaders uh, from the EU and our close European partners, including the United Kingdom. We indeed must use all our energy uh, to build the kind of cooperation we need in today's world. Respecting our mutually agreed agreements centered around trust is an intrinsic part of it. I really would like to thank you for your kind invitation to visit you here in Westminster. I would like to thank you for your attention and of course, uh, I'm sure that uh, Leo, myself uh, uh, and all our delegations are looking forward to hear your views, uh, especially in uh, this House of Commons, which have seen so many lively uh, debates on EU-UK relations and I'm of course uh, happy to answer your question. Thank you very much, both co-chairs. Merci beaucoup. Je vais maintenant passer la parole à Sir Oliver. Thank you very much. I would like to hand over now to Sir Oliver if he wishes to speak. At our first meeting in May, both the Minister and uh, Commissioner Shevkovich agreed that there was a landing zone for an agreement. I seem to remember asking if it was in the same place. <laughs> um, and um, they, they thought so, but uh, they weren't quite sure. But I do commend um, both the government and also the commission for taking the step of having these talks because uh, it really is important that we should resolve the issues. I think the European political community has been a very good step forward in the last uh, few months and I think uh, uh, President Macron uh, took a particular lead on that and I, I think it's very welcome not just to, to Britain but to other European countries which are not part of the EU, but nevertheless part of Europe. I mean, all I'd say about the talks on the Northern Ireland Protocol is I just hope you will finish the job because uh, it's, a, it's a technical, political challenge to find a solution there. And it's all in the context of power sharing, which is a very, it's been a very good way of, of bringing people together in Northern Ireland, but it's not easy in terms of government. Um, and I think the unionist community do feel that the protocol I is unbalanced in the way it works and doesn't sufficiently respect Northern Ireland's place in the UK. But of course it's also important to respect the EU's res reasonable request to ensure that its single market I is not overrun with goods that shouldn't be there. So, so doing this will require practical forward-looking approach, technical discussions going quite deeply into the um, uh, the problems and issues that come up in, in questions about customs and uh, other points uh, of that sort. But I have to say personally that I do think this challenge is achievable, particularly when you think about the anniversary coming up of the Belfast Good, Agre uh, Good Friday Agreement 25 years ago, uh, which was such a challenge to, to, to reach that agreement. It required uh, the whole world to help. Uh, but I am optimistic that our political leaders will be able to rise to the challenge of sorting out uh, these issues. And in the meantime, I hope we can significantly step up our cooperation on energy uh, in the months ahead, uh, particularly given our joint commitment to the Ukraine, and that our next meeting, uh, you will have positive news for us uh, on research cooperation, financial services, our mutual friends, 
uh, and the touring musicians, of course, uh, who uh, uh, everyone wants to see. So uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Je reprends la parole une petite minute, euh, moi aussi, pour remercier nos orateurs. Thank you very much. I'd just like to take a moment to thank, uh, for my part as well, those who've spoken. And I would like to salute the efforts made on both sides, which led to the signing of the agreement, which, as we've just heard, is being implemented. So we count on both sides to find solutions to problems rather than problems in the solutions. The fact is, for many people here in this room, Brexit was the solution and the protocol has become the problem, whereas for others, the opposite applies. The reality, however, is that all involved, the European Union and the United Kingdom, and more specifically in Northern Ireland, all of us need visibility. We need to, to look to the future so that we can concentrate on what's working, on what can work better, while accepting that since the democratic vote which the voters of Britain uh, made, that things have changed. We're all aware of just how much effort has gone into the technical work as which has been done. And I think that together with uh, a genuine political will will enable us to move on to a situation where the situation can be win-win rather than lose-lose. So I do have a list of speakers in front of me. It goes without saying that I start by looking to our British friends, and I'm delighted to be able to give the college to a, a female uh, member, Andrea Ledson. Thank you very much. I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak early. I would just like to make an appeal on behalf of Northern Ireland because I see as a British parliamentarian the fact that it really is in trouble. The community in Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom and yet as things stand they're not subject to the same laws, they're subject to different oversight, they can't have the same VAT rules. It is creating huge problems politically and socially in Northern Ireland which as all colleagues in the room will understand is an area of the United Kingdom that has had so many troubles over so many years. Now, I, as a keen Brexiteer, do wish to say that it was never intended to create this difference. And now, some of you might be saying or thinking, well, serves you right. But the reality is that for a few million people in Northern Ireland, this is a totally desperate situation. They don't have their Northern Ireland Assembly back in place as a result of the fact that the Democratic Unionist Party won't agree to reforming a government until the Northern Ireland Protocol is sorted out. So regardless of the issues and, and the, the different sides of the debate that we all took during the discussion on the referendum of the UK leaving the EU, I do make a personal appeal from my heart to help us to sort out this issue for Northern Ireland. It's such an important part of the UK, and there are so many people in Northern Ireland now who are really struggling, and it's causing real hardship. Thank you very much. The next speaker is my colleague, Sean Kelly. Thanks to both speakers. I would agree with Sir Oliver, we have a problem and uh, we must solve it amicably. So my question revolves around the Northern Ireland Protocol and I have to say that yourself and a number of my colleagues here were in Belfast a few weeks ago as part of the EU Trade Committee and we met stakeholders from all sides, unionist, nationalist, business people, politicians from all political parties, etc. And I would have to say that the protocol is not the major issue for an awful lot of them. Most of them, particularly business people, see there's a need for some type of checks. 
Having said that, some units, not all units, but some units have a difficulty with it, but it's more to do with the link with the United Kingdom than practicality. Also, as uh, Vice President Shevkovich said, at the same time, they, anybody with a head on them can see there's a huge benefit in being in the single market and being in the internal market of the United Kingdom. And there's a wonderful opportunity in the future. Both of you have said we want to resolve it. So my question is, number one, to Minister Doherty, do you accept that there has to be minimal checks? And if not, how does the European Union protect the single market? How do you stop widespread smuggling? Or do you want to take Northern Ireland out of the single market? And the other question then, I think for Vice President Sefcovich is, how do you see things transpiring in terms of trade if the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill goes through as it is or if we don't reach an agreement regarding minimal checks? Thank you very much. Merci. La parole est maintenant à Hilary Benn. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Hilary Benn. Very much indeed. Um, the uh, atmospherics, if I may say so, when we have these discussions between the representatives of the UK government and the commissioner are, are always good, but let's be honest, things have got worse when it comes to the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, since we last met. Because we now have the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which the government has introduced, as a way of trying to solve the problem, uh, which in my view it will not, and we have the Commission having now restarted and added to legal proceedings against the UK government for the things that it hasn't done uh, because it is worried that if the proposals that the uh, Commissioner has tabled previously would end up resulting in more checks, not less. So we have uh, in front of us an economic and a political problem. The political problem is the Good Friday Agreement, as, as my colleague Sean uh, and others have referred to, was really, really important. And power sharing in Northern Ireland really matters. And whether one thinks that, that the party that is currently sitting out and ensuring that the institutions don't work is right or wrong, the fact that the institutions aren't working is a problem that we collectively have to solve. And neither the routes, if I may say so, that uh, either side is... Um, pursuing at the moment is going to solve the problem, only negotiations are going to do so. And I echo what has been said by others, that we really hope that the negotiations could restart because I believe with all my heart that there is a way through this. I think a green lane and a, a express lane, you're not a million miles apart, you said it, Commissioner. Uh, the, the question is, how do we identify the goods that aren't moving on? It's a, it's a practical one, exchange of information, VAT, Honestly, the Commission should say to Britain, you can have whatever rate you like for VAT in Northern Ireland, but if we think it compromises um, the level playing field, then we can take action. We cannot end up with trade sanctions against Britain because of this argument. It is the responsibility on the politicians on both sides to solve it. Merci. Je passe maintenant la parole à Andrea. Thank you. Andreas Schieder. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je voudrais aussi euh, aborder le sujet de l'accord. Nous avions un accord qui a fait l'objet d'un accord des deux côtés, des deux parties. Maintenant, on parle des aspects pratiques de la mise en œuvre, comment l'améliorer, mais nous en sommes encore au point de se demander si on doit le mettre en œuvre. Et à mon avis, c'est l'approche la pire qui existe. It's two guidelines. From the one is, of course, the Good, Good Friday Agreement, which uh, we should never risk, and the other one is, from a European side, the integrity of the domestic market, which we also don't want to risk. But taking this two uh, uh, given, there is a lot of space for easy ways, executions, and so on. So. Uh, until now, I understood also that Commissioner Sefcovic made a long list of proposals how it could be implemented more easier where, where uh, uh, things uh, can be done. So until now, I, I have the feeling it's less about the practical everyday work on the ground. It is more about uh, 
still digesting Brexit or non-Brexit and uh, politically, and therefore I think it's better to get things done on the ground because at the end it is not about the big speeches, it's about the everyday life of the people, this we understand. And I think uh, all the proposals, are, we, we, when they are implemented, could also meet the, 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 the issues of the, every li the everyday life of the people on both sides of the Irish Sea. Thank you. I give the floor to Lord Kirkhope. Thank you very much, Madam. And uh, if I may, I will leave the discussions about Northern Ireland and the protocol to others, because I want to concentrate just for three points on the state of play within the Partnership Council, which is, I think, what this item is largely meant to be about. And the three areas I really want to touch on one is the question of the recognition of professional qualifications. Um, as uh, I'm sure all members know, uh, since January of 2021, the EU ro rules regarding the qualifications no longer apply to the United Kingdom, which leaves us with a situation where we have to use the Partnership Council um, as the basis for discussion, uh, block by block, of professional qualifications being accepted across across the EU and in this country. Uh, speaking as a lawyer now, may I just say that um, my own profession has been very much disadvantaged, particularly some of the larger city entities in this country that produce so much wealth uh, in being unable now to recruit and to operate across bound borders, and this has been to the detriment of the EU uh, as well. Uh, obviously, the TCA set up the framework for that mutual recognition um, through the Partnership Council but it does actually require professional bodies to put forward recommendations for mutual recognition agreements. And I wonder, therefore, my question in that is, has there been any development in this area? And have any professional bodies submitted joint recommendations to the Partnership Council? And uh, Minister Doherty mentioned architects. I presume that is one that has. But I would like clarification. Secondly, on security, we are having a breakout group later to look at cooperation on defense and security uh, regarding cyber defense and, and data exchange. But security operation and Ukraine has already been mentioned. The specialized committee on law enforcement and judicial cooperation, which as you know, sits under the Partnership Council, could perform a key role in ensuring cooperation under that agreement is maximized. But it's only met twice so far. Surely that committee should consider meeting more regularly and can we expect to see more formalized security and defense policy outside of the TCA? Um, I would think that that would be very helpful indeed, and we should proceed with that. And finally, the final provisions, which I think is um, part seven of the TCA, provides for the UK and EU to review the implementation of the agreement and supplementing agreements in any matters related every five years, meaning the first review is due for us in 2024-25. Partnership Council has powers to amend most of the TCA by mutual agreement, therefore allowing changes to be made ahead of that first review. Well, what is the Partnership Council doing to prepare for that review? Uh, we know that negotiations and agreements take literally years. Will there be a role for this assembly in that process? I hope it might be the case. And ahead of the review, what changes does the Partnership Council think might be achievable to strengthen cooperation? Because, ladies and gentlemen, cooperation and negotiation is exactly what we should be promoting through this assembly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before giving the floor to the next speaker, who will be Barry Andrews, I would just like to uh, you to pay attention to the screen behind me. Uh, and if we want to have as many colleagues as possible taking the floor, and eventually if we want to listen the answers of our guest speakers, uh, I would urge us all to try to be as brief as possible and try to keep it to two minutes for the time being and maybe later to only one minute. But so far, two minutes, Barry. I hope that comment wasn't directed personally to me. Uh, <laughs> I try my very best. So just to thank the speakers uh, for their uh, outlining the position, and I would agree with uh, Sean and Hilary that it is surely not beyond the wit of man to, and woman to identify 
that landing ground uh, in the interests of all communities in Northern Ireland. With the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, Minister, I am very concerned that not only does it replace a lack of unionist consent for the lack of consent from the wider majority in Northern Ireland or the alternative, but it also advantages those selling products from GB into Northern Ireland. And that is the feedback that we got from Northern Ireland businesses and community leaders that the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill does not advantage Northern Ireland producers. It advantages GB, GB producers selling into Northern Ireland. I also want to make a comment about the announcement to reinstate the Bill of Rights. Uh, the Bill of Rights is uh, be, uh, being announced to be reinstated by Dominic Grab, and it has a very serious impact on the application of the European Convention Human Rights in Northern Ireland, which is hardwired into the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And I want to hear, if possible, if you have uh, a comment to make on what the impact of the reinstatement of the Bill of Rights will be uh, as regards the application of the European Convention of Human Rights uh, under the Good Friday Agreement. Thank you. Thank you. I give the floor to Lord Kinnell. Thank you very much, Natalie. The, um, <coughs> The European Affairs Committee has been uh, commenting uh, to itself that the impasse in the Northern Ireland Protocol is leading to an enormous blockage of issues that need to be uh, catered for between the UK and the EU to the mutual benefit of both parties. And uh, although we've just heard that the machinery of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement is working, our feeling is that really the motor is built, the motor works, but it's not really motoring anywhere. It's not being used. I note that today uh, I would I'd be very interested in comments from both of the speakers on that uh, observation. Secondly and finally, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill is today for the fifth full day on the floor of the House of Lords and there's been quite a lot of debates on quite a lot of issues uh, in that and um, one of them has been, is very much the involvement of the Northern Ireland communities of every tradition in major changes that are going to happen within Northern Ireland. And the concern that has been expressed on the House of Lords and the concern which has been expressed in European Union Committee reports <laughs> and European Affairs Committee reports uh, is that the protocol process is not fully involving the communities of all traditions in major, major decisions at the moment. And that, that is a weakness. And I wondered if, therefore, you could give some confidence to us all that the, that the <coughs> the, 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 the two traditions or will be involved, it's really more than two traditions now, will be involved uh, in everything that goes on uh, going forward. Thank you. I give the floor to Sean McManus. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and I think we need to remind ourselves of, of a couple of facts. Firstly, is that a majority of voters in the north of Ireland uh, voted against Brexit and to remain within the EU. Secondly, that EU relations and the protocol are not a devolved function. Uh, and thirdly, that the protocol bill in itself is a breach of international law. And it's been allowed by one party, the DUP, to hide behind to create instability, to stop an executive uh, from, from being set up, to address the everyday issues of, of two million citizens within the north of Ireland. And in effect, uh, it, it, what we have now is that the protocol in itself has become a proxy to attack uh, the Good Friday Agreement from those who, who have, been, have, have been in opposition to it from, uh, from, from many years ago because it provides uh, a route map for uh, Irish unity. Um, there is also a suspicion within the nationalist and republican community that I come from that there is an unwillingness from some within the unionist community to accept, in this case, Michelle O'Neill from the nationalist republican community as first minister uh, within the Assembly in the North. The bottom line is this, is, is that the protocol is working. Uh, it's widely supported, especially within the business community uh, and the farming community, but widely uh, acro across the board. Uh, there is no other alternative, uh, and in fact, it needs to be built upon. So I think members of the Assembly here need to take some of those salient points on board. Uh, and Madam Chair, I don't know if we'll have a, an opportunity to get to it at a later stage, so there's a, just a couple of very quick points regarding uh, issues maybe for the Partnership Council in itself to look at. 
and a number of them would be to fashion or craft specific agreements to protect the Good Friday Agreement, which I've said is under uh, that indirect uh, undermining, but specifically agreements around areas like we've had peace funding, and I know it's protected, but that should be looked at in regards to extension towards uh, possibly interreg. If there's no agreement on Horizon, then maybe a specific agreement uh, for the north of Ireland. Uh, and the other thing I would ask is there are specific aspects of uh, legislation here uh, in Westminster, speci specifically the Nationality and Borders Bill, that need to be and should be addressed because they have impact on EU citizens. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is, goes to Sir Tony Lo Lloyd. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Madam Lair. So, um, the, the, what, what is obvious at this, at this time in our history is that with the situation in Ukraine, with uh, um, the, the need for cooperation on en energy, and actually perhaps in the context of this conversation, the need to make sure that we protect the Good Friday Agreement, um, which is both uh, something enshrined by the successive United Kingdom government, but also, of course, by the European Union, that um, it is inconceivable that we're not looking for practical solutions. But what is true, and whilst I agree with us, other speakers, that when I speak to businesses in the North of Ireland, when I speak to uh, uh, different community groups in the North of Ireland, Many people uh, are happy with the working of the protocol. Nevertheless, it is undeniable for, that for a part of the unionist community, the existence of the protocol as is has become not a technical problem, but a political problem. Now, it's in that context I would appeal to both the UK government and to the, uh, and, and to the European Union to recognise that overcoming this political problem is in everybody's interest. And that, that's not to concede the, uh, the point to those in the unionist community, I must say, uh, that their position is, is right and accurate, but it is to recognise that it is real and deeply held. Now, in that context, I think my question to both Minister Doherty on, uh, uh, firstly is, is the UK government prepared to suspend work on the legislation on the protocol in order to allow for the present round of negotiations to move to a successful conclusion? And, of course, to uh, Commissioner Sekulovic, um, the question there really is this. Is the will there now to find the technical solution that can allow the politics to, um, be, to be taken out of the present situation, to allow, yes, the Northern Ireland Assembly to get back to work, but importantly, to allow the cooperation between the EU and the United Kingdom to move forward in everybody's interest? Thank you. Now comes the frustrating moment where I will ask our colleagues to try to stick to one minute. And uh, to be fair, I start with a member of the European Parliament. Don't blame me, David. I give the floor to David McAllister. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. I just wanted to um, echo what several colleagues have already mentioned. Isn't really now the time that we move on? Uh, on the Northern Ireland uh, protocol issues. And I think all our British colleagues need to be aware that this current Northern Ireland protocol bill is a real stumbling block, which we simply uh, cannot accept. And that's why, how can we move forward? And what Commissioner Shevchevic said uh, is important that we also need to be aware what would be at risk. And at risk would be on the one hand, a serious trade conflict with the European Union and also the Northern Irish access to the single market. So I would call on all sides responsible. Please, let's move on and find a solution for the benefit of the people of Northern Ireland. Thank you. I give the floor to Robert Goodwill. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, could I, first of all, endorse what uh, Minister Doherty said about uh, horizon and other uh, scientific cooperation. I think um, there's no logical reason why that should be linked to progress on the protocol. Uh, and also we see widespread uh, cooperation between industrial uh, operators at both sides of the channel. You know, recently um, people like Rhein Metall and BA Systems are working together on research. But I'd like to specifically ask about uh, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, a CBAM. And I know the European Union are, are looking at introducing one. I think we should too. Uh, and I've always been one, a person that thinks we should try and anticipate problems and come up with solutions before they happen. So 
uh, given the distortion that may have on trade between the EU and the UK, are we looking to try and start negotiation to see how EBAMs in both countries can work together and so we don't have restrictions on trade? Thank you. Next is Laurent Vince. Thank you, Chair. I would uh, also agree with the colleagues that said that we cannot take steps forward since we have uh, the Northern Iron Protocol like, that is like uh, Achilles tendon uh, to the advancement uh, of uh, the uh, relationship. Uh, I think the solution is not to tearing uh, up the protocol or calling for a new election in Northern Ireland that would obviously have no evident usefulness, but more commitment from the UK to an honest and constructive approach to the EU UK uh, uh, relations. Um, I hope that uh, in the upcoming months both sides will be able to return to the basic uh, premise for the need of the Northern Irish Protocol. The need to avoid a hard uh, border on the island of, of, of Ireland while also respecting the, in the integrity of the single market. Um, I think engagement should not be difficult for the people of Northern Ireland. We need to think about them. The majority of them, 71%, would prefer to see the UK and the EU reaching an agreement on the protocols implementation, then uh, the UK to take unilateral action. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Baroness Nicholson. Uh, merci, madame. Uh, colleagues, we have this amazing cooperation about Ukraine, absolutely fantastic. But is not now the time to make that cooperation look further forward uh, when the war finishes, which at some point it most certainly will, we may not be ready to cooperate in quite the same way unless we make the plans now. <laughs> Could I ask our partnership to think very seriously with that direction? Thank you. Our next is Danuta Hübner. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Well, one comment and two short questions. I, I think it's important when we discuss those bilateral issues, difficult as they are, we also have to have in the back of our head the fact that we are living at the confluence of traditional um, challenges uh, and, and also new global threats and new global uh, risks. And uh, that's why we have to use actually the momentum uh, now to uh, to, accept, to gather unprecedented amount of political will, also I think the spirit of uh, cooperation and, and responsibility. And I have two questions, one to Minister Doherty. Um, uh, do, do you uh, see the risk that if the Northern Irish, or Irish bill, if you call it like, like this, were to become the law, uh, bringing risk to the integrity of uh, 450 million uh, people uh, internal uh, market, the conditions for Northern Ireland access to the um, single market of the European Union will be put at, at huge uh, risk, and um, we nobody, I think, can can afford it. And to uh, Vice President Sevcovic, uh, would you agree that we can um, uh, that we can find a, a negotiated uh, solution based on a full availability of real-time uh, data? Um, and that would allow us to reduce uh, substantially the controls to actually come to a minimum level of uh, controls. Uh, but this would, would you also agree that this would not be possible unless we see the, uh, this uh, Irish bill proceedings uh, suspended in the British Parliament? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dr. Philippa Whitford. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. It strikes me, being from Northern Ireland, that people are forgetting that the majority of people in Northern Ireland do actually support the protocol. There is no question about the practical issues, and I've seen them on visits. And it strikes me that there's two strands. One is exactly what's being talked about, trying to smooth the, the movement between GB and Northern Ireland. Could we have an agreement with the UK government to put the protocol bill which brings the second strand, the political side, in, because maybe by smoothing out the workings of the protocol, there could be a degree of trust, rather than adding in European Court of Justice, using language talking about getting rid of the protocol, because we're in danger that there will be those among the unionist community who think they have been promised by the UK government to get rid of the protocol. That's the language that's been used and that becomes a political block. So could we separate the two strands and try and work on the practical bit first 
to build trust. Next is Cole Marquet. Thank you, Chair, and just to, well, firstly, to thank the comments of the initial speakers in terms of the positive mood, but to pick up on the, the last speaker's comments. I think if we could focus on the, the practical over the politics, as it was said by other speakers, the protocol in many ways is working, but surely if we can focus on the work of the joint, uh, joint committees uh, in relation to, or the specialised committees, should I say, in relation to the, the practical matters that need to be addressed on the ground, that we can move away from the, the political debate uh, and try and focus around practical solutions, and in so doing, maybe depoliticise de de some of the situation. Um, in terms of just, I suppose, moving on and um, the discussions around, uh, let's say, the protocol bill, to me, it's back to the spirit of what we've had over the last number of weeks with the political changes across the board. If we can unify the discussions and avoid, if you like, the unilateral actions, I think that will, will make such a difference in recognition of what the previous speaker has said, that if we can work together on practical matters as opposed to a, a focusing on the, the politics of it. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, two last colleagues. First is Lord Hanman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, my old friend Sean Kelly, whom it's very nice to see here, asked whether there should be minimal checks or zero checks. I suppose just thinking about the goods that move in the other direction, that enter the UK, whether from Ireland or across the Channel. At the moment, they are subject to no checks. Now, I know that there's some uh, debate here about whether that's sustainable and whether it's compatible with WTO laws and whether we need to uh, institute some kind of formalized procedures. But in my view, we should carry on having no checks. After all, these countries are friends and allies. We know their standards. And I hope we can have a risk-based system where we would only institute verification if there is a specific and identified threat rather than having them across the board. And finally, Baroness Crawley. Can I thank our speakers and uh, say that uh, the protocol bill is extremely unhelpful um, and many in the Lords, including myself, will not be supporting it. Um, could I ask uh, the speakers uh, a question each, please? Uh, Mr. Sefcovich, would you be willing to look at a more risk-based approach, as Mr. Hannan has just said, in the implementation of the protocol, given that over the past two years, the protocol has not been fully implemented, it's been operating on grace periods, and that constitutes an evidence base that should be taken into account uh, when assessing the level of associated risk to the single market. And to uh, our minister, uh, Minister Doherty, do you agree that real trust needs to be established once again between the UK and the EU? And that that might mean more flexibility from the UK on issues such as allowing the EU access to granular data in real time that provides an accurate picture of goods movements for them. Merci beaucoup à l'ensemble des collègues. Je vais rapidement. Thank you very much to all colleagues. I will briefly give back the floor to our guests so that they can reply and react to the questions. Mr. Sefcovic, you have five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> I, will do, I will do my best. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you very much for, uh, I would say, very open, at the same time, constructive and, and cooperative discussions because, I mean, uh, what I, both Leo and myself are feeling from our discussion is that you want us to work together, you want us to find the solutions, you want us to de-dramatize the situation, you want us to be pragmatic, and, and you, you want us to show that we can actually find the solutions to what might seem sometimes very complex issue. And that's the attitude uh, which I have and uh, our team has from the beginning and will continue to be guided uh, by this can-do, problem-solving, solution-driven approach. That's what we want to achieve. We discussed a lot, and it was a uh, right uh, call from all of you, uh, the situation in, uh, in Northern Ireland. And what I think it's very, very important to, to, uh, to underline, and I would like to reassure all of you in this hall, 
that this is the area where we do not seek any political victory. We just want to solve the problem. And uh, we want to solve the problem in the best way possible for the people in Northern Ireland. We want to offer them um, uh, this unprecedented advantage that would be a unique place, only place on this planet where you will have access to the two uh, most uh, competitive uh, internal markets. There will be no hard border. We are offering legal certainty, predictability, so no compliance officer in the Northern Ireland or important uh, importer in the continental uh, EU would ever have a question if the goods coming uh, from from Northern Ireland, I mean, uh, should be should be checked because it's part of the of the of the of the of the single market. That the goal, which is there um, uh, uh, for us, and we know how important it is to solve all uh, these issues uh, before the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday uh, Belfast Agreement, because build into the system stronger safeguards we would get uh, from the from the from the UK, uh, more of a flexibility we would be looking for. But to respond to, to questions of, uh, of, uh, of, of many of you, I have all your names, but I know Natalie and she's pretty strict chair, so I'll probably not get through, 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 through all of that uh, and through all, through all of names, so I, I, I really apologize, apologize for that. But um, just take that example which I, which I have mentioned. The cargo, the container is, is loaded uh, on, the, on the ferry in GB. Data is downloaded, we have access to the, to the IT, it's processed remotely by the EU officials. Before the ferry arrives into the Northern Ireland, risk analysis, this is this risk-based approach, is uh, done. And what we need to have reassurances uh, from the UK is that the border police uh, or the officials uh, upon the arrival um, uh, to, the, to the Northern Ireland uh, would be responsive. And they said, hey, look guys, according to risk analysis, you think there must be some kind of poison shrimp, dangerous toy, some illegal stuff. Will you check it, please? Because you will be doing the checks, not us. We completely, um, uh, we, we, we completely outsource uh, this control and checks of our external border to you. And you, will, you have to understand that it has to be based on a mutual trust. But I'm sure that if we do our things right, it would be a couple of lorries stopped per day. So that's the system we are, we are, we are, we are, uh, aiming, uh, we are aiming at. And uh, uh, not only uh, this, and this is, I think, the answer to one of the last speakers, uh, Baroness uh, Crowley. We are fully for the risk-based uh, uh, approach, which we can really develop uh, based on this uh, minimum necessary uh, checks and data uh, we need, and hopefully the UK will uh, share with us. On top of it, what we are proposing to our UK counterparts is significant facilitation for trade. We are suggesting 80% cuts if it comes to SPS controls, uh, more than 50% cut of the red tape if it comes to all the customs procedure, just to make it very, very easy. When we met the last time, I was showing you how uh, this uh, declaration should look like. It's two and a half page, one per lorry, one per month. For all the goods you will, be, you will be sending to the Northern Ireland. Is it too much to do this? Cannot we find pragmatic, technical solutions to, to make these things work? I believe that it could be done, and if there is political will, I, I, I'm sure that we can sort it out uh, really within a within couple of weeks, because I think on both sides uh, of our negotiating teams, we, we, we know these topics from, uh, from, from, from all, all angles. And I would say that uh, it, uh, it applies uh, uh, to uh, all other solutions. I hope you would uh, uh, understand that for us to continue the negotiations with our uh, British colleagues uh, while the Northern Ireland bill is, is, is going through the parliamentary process here was a very friendly decision. It was not an easy one. It was not an easy one. And, and I can tell you that uh, um, we had uh, very intense debate about it also within uh, the European Parliament and also within the European Commission. But we clearly said we want to solve this problem. We do not want litigation. We do not want legal recourse. We want to solve this issue politically through negotiations because that's what the friends, partners, allies, and biggest trading partners should do. So that's our approach. And therefore, despite the fact 
the Northern Ireland bill will completely change for the negative, uh, our, our mutual relationship if adopted. We are still talking, negotiating, offering creative solutions. And then I think a lot has been said about the overall political, political atmosphere. And for sure we can do much more in research and innovation, in energy, in, in, in all other uh, areas. Uh, but you also have to understand what is, uh, I would say, the feeling on the uh, other side of the channel. We have two very fundamental agreements signed uh, with the UK. We've been negotiating them for years and years and years, line by line, they've been approved, ratified, celebrated together that we, we achieved uh, this orderly, uh, orderly uh, divorce. And now, uh, um, uh, you know, the fundamental part of it uh, uh, is not respected. Uh, we have seen one unilateral action after another one. And if you would be in, in our shoes, would you negotiate with such a partner? Third agreement, would you go into the negotiations on another agreement when two fundamental uh, agreements which have been, which were negotiated in a great detail have been, have been not respected? So what I want to say is uh, let's focus on what I think it's very important from the perspective of the Northern Ireland people, from the perspective of peace in the Northern Ireland, from the perspective of our EU-UK uh, uh, relations. Let's resolve these issues, which we know so well, and uh, let's open new chapter, which I think would be absolutely correct and right for such a close allies as the EU and, and the UK. And let's cooperate in all these areas uh, uh, you mentioned and for which uh, we, uh, we have, I think, preconditions uh, created in both uh, withdrawal uh, agreement and uh, in uh, trade uh, and uh, cooperation agreement, because uh, we are absolutely prepared and uh, uh, ready for it. So the, so, the, so the last point I would say, now it's the time, and that was my appeal, and I really would like to appreciate uh, new tonality, new approach, uh, uh, very uh, frank and sincere conversation I have with the Foreign Secretary, James, James Cleverly. I hope that this positive tonality would be also uh, uh, translated into a little bit more of a, uh, I would say, negotiating space uh, for our team so we can really creatively look at all possibilities how to resolve uh, these issues. So next time when we would meet, we will be able to present you a better solutions and, 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 and better uh, better, uh, better picture, and it's definitely not the time to continue rehearsing the, the arguments which we know so well and, and what we are doing over the last two years. So that's that's our uh, political appeal, that's our political political offer, and uh, I can assure you that we are ready to work as intensely as required, to meet as frequently as needed, and to be as creative as uh, the challenge uh, demands simply to make sure that we would uh, resolve these issues and can open a new, uh, I would say, much better uh, uh, chapter on our uh, mutual uh, relations. And if, Natalie, you would see that some of the concrete uh, questions here would require more detailed answer, I'm ready to do so, but I know that we are under the time pressure and I leave it in your hands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, I'm not as strict as you portrayed me, um, <laughs> because you went much further than your five minutes. But that's, of course, important that you provide answers to the questions which were raised. And now I give the floor to Minister Dogherty. Thank you very much indeed, Natalie. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and cover off um, some of the technical questions and also make some quite broad remarks. But I think, firstly, one of the themes, one of the themes of this afternoon's discussions is quite simply trust and our need to have a trustful uh, relationship going both ways. And what I hope to do really is offer some assurance that we, we recognize that requirement. And when it comes to uh, the practical elements of ensuring that there's a trusting relationship going both ways, um, uh, in reply to one of the final questions that was raised, we are strongly pro things like uh, data sharing. We've made good progress in that regard. Uh, and ensuring there are as, as, as minimal uh, checks as possible. And we do that. We, we take that approach because we recognize that trust is at the, the heart of, uh, of our approach. And we are sincere when we say that we do genuinely want. With regard to the, the, the bill going through uh, the House of Lords, and you will observe it's in its uh, fourth uh, committee day today, 
uh, we, are, we are not expediting the progress of that bill. Many of you will know that um, you know, laws like sausages take time to be made and they're quite slow. Um, it's, it's going through its normal uh, course uh, through the legislative procedure and we're not expediting it, but we're not halting it. We're just letting it go uh, forward um, as it would. But I should offer assurance to uh, one colleague here who asked about um, ECHR and the Bill of Rights, uh, uh, I think following comments from, or the reappointment of, of, of Dominic Raab, I can offer you absolute reassurance that we don't expect the, uh, the, the role of the ECHR to change at all as a consequence of uh, any Bill of Rights. Moving now to some of the other technical questions. Firstly, Lord Kirk Hope asked about re um, recognition of professional uh, qualifications. Architects indeed are leading the way, but we hope others might uh, follow as quickly as possible uh, uh, across other sectors. Uh, you mentioned, Your Lordship, uh, military cooperation. Uh, we're very pleased about some of the work that's been done on military mobility, uh, because of course that's a, that's a really critical element of our capacity to collectively respond to uh, Russian aggression. And of course, we maintain the broad range of informal cooperation across uh, many defence uh, spheres in, in, in the bilateral context, which is hugely important. Um, with, with regard to the review of the TCA, we would welcome contributions uh, to that. There's no formal discussions as yet with the EU on this, but we agree that we need to start planning that um, quite soon. Um, Lord Kirill, you mentioned um, taking account of all communities in Northern Ireland. We're certainly doing that, and I shall be in Northern Ireland speaking to all communities uh, next week. Um, you mentioned, uh, again, the TCA, and we want to go as fast as possible. We want to put the foot on the gas in terms of things like uh, energy cooperation. Um, I should mention, in terms of the broader context of energy cooperation, which, always, uh, which, which was also um, a, a topic um, which uh, Tony Lloyd asked about, Clearly, in the context of our collective response to Ukraine, um, um, energy cooperation is more important than ever before. And last week, I was seeing the electrical interconnector between here and Belgium. It's a, it's a, it's a fantastic example of the uh, amazing power of, uh, of uh, um, uh, cooperation uh, as, a, as, a, as a force multiplier and the capacity we have in the North Sea to make hybrid connectors that allow us to unlock the potential, renew uh, potential for renewable energy in the North Sea. Um, which was a good outcome of the European uh, political community, by the way. Uh, that potential is huge, and we are very ambitious and excited about that cooperation in the North Sea uh, with regard to energy cooperation. Um, just covering off other technical uh, questions, uh, Robert Goodwill had a question about Horizon, totally agree with that, uh, and also CBAM. We've got our own emissions trading scheme, so we don't really see the need for that, but uh, we're going in the same direction, I think. And I should... Just put on record, happy to cover off anything else technical, um, but I, if I can just, by way of tone, I want to reiterate my thanks, uh, Madam, for, uh, for you, you convening this today, and also uh, the, the positive tone that uh, the Vice President Shostakovich has um, brought to um, the, the negotiations, the renewed negotiations, and I think we collectively hope that the political opportunity that having a new Prime Minister um, brings <laughs> will uh, perhaps afford us an opportunity to, to, to push forward on these negotiations with all sincerity. And I should say also, because he's in the room and he's in his final week in post, I think, well, not final couple of weeks in post, I should say a sincere thanks to Jean for all of the work that he has done as the ambassador into, into London and um, uh, the embodiment of cooperation. The embodiment of cooperation. Thank you, Jean, for all you do, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Minister. Um, I will not conclude because we are running out of time and I want to uh, um, give the floor to my uh, friend, Sir Oliver, only to say that we see that the situation is still complex. We all um, are uh, asking for uh, moving forward, so we should all try to commit ourselves to come not with statements, not with speeches as regards uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol, but with concrete, mutually acceptable solutions. Time for speaking is over. Time for fixing what needs to be fixed is now because there are so many things that we can do together. Now, um, I hand the uh, cheering to my uh, dear friend, Sir Oliver, for the next item of the agenda. Thank you very much. We'll need to just arrange the table.
One minute warning. Right, can we resume our seats? Uh, we better get going on the energy cooperation. Order, order. Please uh, take your seats. Thank you. Uh, if, co if colleagues could take their seats, thank you. Uh, there will be time for discussions and coffee after the uh, energy cooperation discussion. So, at our last meeting in May, thank you, uh, we held a discussion on energy cooperation between the EU and the UK. And it's sad that that debate proved as prescient as it has done and that the issue of energy supply, security and prices is more urgent today than it was six months ago. On this occasion, we're pleased to have with us two guest speakers who will share their thoughts on the situation before opening up the debate to the floor. Uh, we welcome uh, Mr. Morten Pedersen, uh, who is a Danish member of the European Parliament, uh, who will speak uh, on this issue. Uh, he was uh, an early supporter of the UK uh, cooperating in the North Sea Energy Group as rapporteur of the European Parliament Committee on Industry, Research and Ener Energy. And we're very grateful that he made that uh, recommendation because, of course, uh, it's something that... Uh, uh, we supported in May and now uh, seems close to happening. We're also grateful to have with us the Minister for Energy, the Right Honourable Graham Stewart, MP, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank you both so much for accepting the invitation to speak to us, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. And I just uh, mentioned that the Minister has another engagement and so will not be here at the end of the debate, but I understand Mr. Pedersen will. So, uh, Mr. Pettersson, are you there? Well, in that case, I, I, I'm going to reverse the order of speakers and invite, um, invite the Minister, uh, Graham Stewart, to address us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Oliver. A short while, and so it was. It was good to see Maris again, and uh, and see that my successor is following up on the um, the excellent progress that uh, was made while uh, uh, Maris and I and uh, and various others uh, uh, dealt with some of the issues and challenges that face that face us in our cooperation. But now I'm the Minister for Energy and indeed Climate, um, an area in which I've been interested a, uh, for a long time, and I know many in this room will equally be. Um, uh, fascinated by and uh, interested in. Um, I'd like to thank uh, you all for the invitation to speak on this uh, extremely important topic of UK-EU energy cooperation. Um, what we all know is we live in extraordinary times that we've seen uh, war come back to the European continent with Putin's unprovoked invasion and that, that has thrown decisions by almost every nation in Europe uh, thrown them into a harsh light um, because of the pressure that's put on that most fundamental of resources, namely energy. Even countries that aren't reliant on Russian oil and gas are impacted by skyrocketing global energy prices. And international collaboration this winter and beyond will be essential in promoting energy security in Europe and mitigating Putin's ability to weaponize energy. Um, and of course, it's worth noting that during the, in the past summer, uh, we've seen the UK able to use its, um, its own domestic gas resources, the, uh, the pipeline which comes in, in fact, to my constituency uh, from Norway, Langerled, and of course the liquid natural gas um, uh, facilities and infrastructure that we have to help uh, provide gas into European storage to help uh, the continent get through this uh, winter. And at the same time, of course, the the French nuclear fleet has been down for maintenance, and again, in ways that were, uh, are not normal, um, uh, we were exporting electricity at a time when we might have been more likely to be importing it 
showing you how important it is that we work together, that we use our interconnectors, um, and that by that kind of cooperation provides security for us all, even in the most testing times. Uh, the current geopolitical context demonstrates uh, that UK-EU cooperation, including the delivery of commitments in the energy title of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, is absolutely vital to achieving shared energy resilience. Now, by investing in renewable and clean energy, we don't just achieve our climate goals, we can improve the security of supply, which is so critical to, uh, for flourishing economies. And we can unlock new industries, new jobs, and new skills as we do so. Now, to realize these opportunities and deliver our, co our commitment to reach net zero by 2050, cooperating with our neighbors and friends around the North Seas is essential. And a joined up approach in the North Seas will allow us to utilize the vast offshore wind potential um, they provide to maximum effect. We want to exchange experience and knowledge uh, with others and get on with delivering the next generation of European hybrid energy projects. Our ambition here is to deliver up to 50 gigawatts, about a five-fold increase, of offshore wind by 2030, including up to five gigawatts of innovative floating wind. And we've made a good start. Offshore wind is now 70% cheaper than it used to be, uh, thanks in no small part to the UK leading the deployment of that technology um, and using, creating the contracts for different auction system. Um, and it has seen production increase massively. In fact, my, my constituency seems to be energy central in the UK. I have Langerled coming on board. I have rough offshore gas storage, which uh, uh, was shut down for a while, but has now reopened. I have onshore gas storage. Um, and I have uh, Hornsey, uh, too, has just opened fully operational, which is the world's largest offshore wind platform. And that's named after a small town in my constituency as well. And the Equinor-led um, uh, uh, hydrogen um, to the Humber program is based in Saltenda, um, a, an industrial park in my um, constituency. But uh, so I'm, years ago when we put offshore wind into the North Sea, I wasn't convinced necessarily that we would be able to drive the cost curve downwards, which is central part, I think, of, of tackling the climate challenge. But actually we went from 120 pounds a megawatt hour in 2015 down to 39.50, just two auctions later in 2019. Quite remarkable when you uh, give those signals and unleash the market and give them a sufficient pipeline to invest. Um, at the European Political Community meeting in October, as you may be aware, UK and EU leaders set out support for the UK's re-engagement in the North Sea's energy cooperation, one of the commitments in the TCA energy title. And I welcome the completion of technical level negotiations on the North Sea's energy cooperation memorandum of understanding and we expect that to be sh signed shortly. And just to say the UK is keen to work alongside the EU and private investors to get North Sea's hybrid projects out of the starting blocks and overcome any remaining technical, regulatory, and financial hurdles which crop, crop up along the way. But the potential of the North Seas can only be achieved by delivering on the other major commitments we made in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement's energy title. In particular, the development of new efficient electricity trading arrangements will allow us to maximize the clean electricity generated in the North Seas. New arrangements could, would make electricity more affordable, reliable, and help integrate low carbon technologies into the grid. As we set out at all three specialized committee meetings, most recently in September, the UK continues to have significant concerns about delays to the implementation of new trading arrangements and that the timeline agreed in the treaty has not been met. And when you put that in the context of the remarkable acceleration that is required by all our countries in order to deliver our commitments to net zero, such delays make no sense. And political concerns in one area cannot be allowed to come over and get in the way of the commitments that we have all collectively made to, and put it at the highest level, to saving the planet. We need to get on, we need to make that happen. And I know just looking at UK domestic, it's my job to look at accelerating um, and driving the transition to uh, green energy, just to take our grid investments. And of course, grid cooperation in the North Sea is a really important way of, of um, uh, improving efficiency, speeding up uh, deployment and maintaining, carrying our people with us because 
more and more infrastructure could attract more and more opposition if we don't handle it well. Um, we, the national grid here, say that we need to uh, make uh, an investment between now and 2030, which is horribly close, six times more between now and 2030 than in the whole of the last 30 years. Um, and without that, we will not be able to harness the deployment that we are seeking. And I imagine in other countries it will be similarly stark and severe. So therefore, if insofar as it's within our power to do so, recognizing that cooperation <laughs> is absolutely necessary to deliver this, I think is, is something I would just try and land with you. Um, uh, the, it, I, I was going to say, now that is an obviously, an obviously a matter of absolute priority. Um, we can work together with our uh, technical experts so as to realize the potential cost and carbon benefits for our consumers and businesses as soon as possible. And in another area I'm interested in, if you want to uh, decarbonize industry, then I'm told there is pretty much no way to do it except in some cases using carbon capture and storage, where you have a sort of point place where you can capture that, and other industry isn't, it won't work for that. And therefore the only way to do that is through, at the moment, that people can see is hydrogen. So we need hydrogen and carbon capture, and the UK and Norway, as it happens, have, I think, around 80% of the potential storage capability. Again, if we are all to move together and decarbonize industry across Western Europe, we need to work together, we need to have the cooperation in place, the trust, et cetera, to utilize those sinks, again, at the lowest possible cost, so that industry, whether it's in the Rhine or in the UK, um, or indeed uh, in the Loire, is as competitive as possible, um, and therefore it's something that we need to get right. So given the current context, the UK has been exploring long-term solutions to improve energy resilience and reduce costs. So in addition to interventions, such as the energy price guarantee, that's where we've basically uh, intervened to protect houses and uh, lower the average um, uh, bills from a possible three and a half thousand pounds to an average of no more than around two and a half thousand pounds. In addition to interventions like that, um, we launched a consultation into the electricity market uh, and electricity market reform in July. Because in a sense, our, our system up to now has been very much kind of responded to um, uh, demands on it and rather slowly. And we need to change the whole system so we have anticipatory inv investment and we don't allow um, parts of infrastructure to slow down what is an extremely challenging um, uh, uh, conversion. We're keen to hear from and share information with European partners who we know are considering the same questions, unlocking the potential of cheap renewable energy generation and creating sustainable answers to the current high prices. So in summary, the cost of inaction is too high a price to pay. The trade and, and cooperation agreement gives us a, the bedrock for a positive ongoing relationship between the UK and EU, and it's vital that we deliver on, our, on our, the energy commitments to be found in that to meet the challenges ahead. So, and the final point I'd just make, and it's an area of particular interest for me, is those who develop the technologies of tomorrow will lead global markets for generations to come. There's a real opportunity, and there's so much opportunity, there's plenty of opportunity to go around. If we cooperate, we work together, we drive that change, we can develop the industries with the technical solutions, which will not only mean that we meet our environmental obligations, it'll mean we can export um, and uh, provide those services to the rest of the world, uh, giving uh, long-term uh, job security and prosperity at home while delivering a truly global solution to a global problem. Thank you. So my apologies that I have to head off. I do apologise. No, well, I'd so I'd like nothing better than to have to sit and have a proper engagement. <laughs> no, I, I understand that you have another commitment, but thank you so much for, for coming, and it's been a very uh, interesting uh, tour of the, of the main issues, which will set us off uh, for our debate. So thank you very much. Now, of course, Graham was talking about technical solutions, and I'm just wondering if we've had one. <laughs> um, is, is Mr. Patterson with us or, or not? I can't hear any uh, signs that he is, so I think in those circumstances we'll move to our uh, first speaker. And um, 
We'll start, of course, with the European Parliament, as uh, I'm chairing it, and uh, Sean Kelly, our Vice Chairman. Thank you very much, and it's a pity that uh, Lord Honourable Stewart can't be with us because many of the points he made were very interesting and very practical. And I think uh, whatever about the issues that we were discussing in the previous discussion, here uh, the United Kingdom have been world leaders in many respects, and they're sharing an awful lot of their knowledge. And of course, are very closely interconnected with Europe. So while uh, the United Kingdom has left the European Union, in actual fact, in terms of energy, it will be closer connected from now on than ever before, which is a good thing. We have uh, issues in relation to energy, particularly in my own country, which I would have liked to ask uh, uh, Mr. Stewart about, and which we have incorporated into some of our legislation in the European Union, especially in relation to renewable energy, wide and so forth, and that's the whole area of planning and permitting. And he did say that we have to be careful that we don't create opposition. But one of the things that we are looking at doing, and hopefully is uh, incorporating it into legislation, is for projects that would be in the interest of decarbonizing the economy would be at least uh, speeded up or fast-tracked so that they can get planning and they wouldn't be held up. I know in my own country I was speaking to a developer recently who put up a solar farm. It took him eight years, eight years to get planning because of all the processes we have which needs to be addressed. Also, it would be interesting from a European perspective, the whole question of nuclear energy. I mean, it's extraordinary that one country can be totally against this on the basis that it's going to go cause huge damage to the environment and the health of people, and another country can have no difficulty with it. And I think the United Kingdom are looking at more nuclear, which, with the development again, is probably safer now than ever before. So these are issues we have to look at. And then, of course, we have the interconnectors between the United Kingdom and other places, uh, for instance, in Ireland, without the interconnector from Moffat, we would have probably very little gas and becoming more and more dependent on it. So cooperation is needed, cooperation is there, and we need to harness our resources to develop, as he said, the renewable energy, etc., the vast potential of which we have, and we need to develop cooperatively. And I think we should be emphasizing that a lot more, because with Brexit, everything is seen to be kind of EU versus the United Kingdom, but in actual fact, in this area, we are actually coming closer than ever, and will be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that, Sean. And uh, I understand we do have a technical solution now, so perhaps we'll hear from uh, Morton Pettison, uh, who's, of course, the rapporteur of the committee which recommended that um, the UK should be able to cooperate in the North Sea Energy Group. Uh, and I'll also uh, just mention to, to, to Sean that if, if, as long as Natalie is happy, um, I'll ask officials to make a note of the points made in the debate and, uh, and, and I will or we can write to Graham Stewart uh, so that perhaps we'll get a reply in that way. So um, I'd like to give you the floor, uh, Morton Pettison, if you're there. I'm here. Thank you so much and uh, thanks for your patience and uh, apologies for, uh, for the technical issues uh, and thank uh, well, you for giving there, but we can't hear you all right is this better i hope i'm coming through yes you're there so thank you very uh, much i've introduced thank you so the floor is yours thank you so much and apologies uh, for all these uh, technical issues i'm so happy to uh, to be with you today one should have thought after million of zoom meetings that the Uh, these are extremely challenging and sensitive times in, in, in the energy uh, domain, which, uh, as, as Sean rightfully put, uh, just calls for uh, cooperation on, on, 
uh, as many areas as possible, given uh, the TCA and given what uh, what what we've agreed upon uh, already. So apart from all the various very technical files that we're working on from the uh, European Parliament side in adopting the Fit for 55 package um, on on renewables, on energy efficiency, on on buildings directive, we really have. Uh, a very big task uh, at hand and, and a lot of work in, in, in the industry and energy committee in, in, in fulfilling all, all these work, all this uh, extremely uh, important legislation. And, and I would just like to emphasize further the point made on, on cooperation on the offshore renewable uh, issues, because um, as we all know perfectly well, uh, Europe at large, including UK, needs to deploy uh, more renewables uh, at a much faster pace than we've managed to uh, to do so far. And I, I think it's it might be of interest uh, that that we will very soon adopt some new measures in terms of ensuring a faster permitting, because this is really the bottleneck in picking up speed in terms of deploying uh, renewables, offshore renewables. Uh, even even further, and and obviously uh, there, there's a good reason for cooperating for cooperating on on some of these uh, difficult and sensitive issues, given what the countries surrounding the North Sea are, are planning to do. Because if we are to succeed, if we are to ramp up to the extent that we want to do and at the pace that we want to do, then we need to ensure that we get it right in terms of infrastructure, in terms of cooperation, in terms of of, of permitting. So I, I think there's uh, ample reason to cooperate on, on, on these issues and, and these measures. Um, I mean, we need to pick up speed at, and, and enforce it with a factor of four or five compared to what we are doing today. So we really need to get our, our act together from the EU side, which is what we are working hard on. And for sure, there's a very good need and reason for cooperating uh, with the UK on, on, on this. So let me just uh, wrap it up here, and I'm looking so much forward to uh, to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pedersen. Can I say that the minister who spoke before you, before we could get the connection up, um, he, he made that key point too, that we really do need to ramp up uh, what we're doing in terms of investment uh, on this. And uh, so now I'll um, uh, open the discussion, and perhaps if uh, Mr. Pedersen would like to, to make some uh, remarks at the end. But um, uh, our next speaker then uh, is Dame Andrea Ledson. <coughs> Thank you very much, Sir Oliver. Um, I would just really like to make the observation that this is an area where the UK and the EU's interests are so very much aligned. And having been an energy minister and a business secretary responsible for energy policy in the past, it seems to me that you can both argue for tackling our desire to reach net zero from a climate change perspective, but you can also tackle it from a jobs and growth perspective. And both of those things should be top priorities for all of us in the United Kingdom and across the European Union. So certainly in the UK, we've seen huge deployment of offshore wind. Um, we're seeing an enormous growth in our ability to electrify our energy sources. And there is a great commitment from the UK government. But at the same time, it's so important to be doing more trading with the EU to have more <laughs> interconnection to have more cross-working, to perhaps look at things like nuclear, where the UK is expanding our nuclear resources with support from largely French nuclear providers, um, but at the same time for us to work with the EU on things like carbon capture and, of course, on green hydrogen, getting more battery-operated storage up and going so that we can make better baseload use of otherwise intermittent technologies. So there is so much we could do together, and it seems to me this is one of the critical areas that if we want to build jobs and growth for everything from apprenticeships, for young people who perhaps aren't going to go on to be the brilliant scientists of tomorrow, all the way through decarbonizing heavy industry, of which there is still so much in Europe, and through to science and technology where we can really lead the world. And in particular, an interest of mine is in green finance. And I do think that the UK, working closely with Europe, can actually be a big provider 
of finance for green infrastructure projects around the world, as well as exports of technology. So it's an area we can really do a lot together, and, and so I, I feel very hopeful in that area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Eric Bergvist. Thank you very much, and I think uh, our colleague Morten's connection problem showed us what it's all about. If you fail the first connection, try again. If you fail the second connection, try until you succeed. And I think that's true for the energy market, and I think it's true uh, for most things we will do in a successful way among other humans. For me, it feels uh, like a little the circle is closing to be able to speak here about energy. Uh, remembering 20 years ago when I was invited to Aberdeen to talk about our experience of district heating in an Arctic region. They were about to do that in, in a less Arctic region. Uh, I hope they succeeded. Uh, well, energy also in a more philosophical way is what in a way keeps it all together and is uh, similar for all of us. It can't be created, it can't be destroyed, and I guess that's also what makes it so, so important and valuable. Uh, it's if we have one basic raw material, one basic thing we need, it's, it's energy. Uh, and we can also see now how we are all connected, even though we can see that our connections sometimes are not as good as they we would like them to be, but we are all affected right now by Russia's energy war, uh, or at least when they use energy as part of, of their warfare. Uh, we have seen that before, how it's not perhaps in warfare, but uh, as a part of negotiations, OPEC and others, how energy is really, really important for all of us and how it affects us with inflation and, 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 and other things. Uh, and I would say that the, the resolution we have now is a really good ground to, to stand on. Uh, and I'm very optimistic. Uh, I agree with Morten uh, that we have to speed up uh, permitting processes and other things. We pretty much have the technique already, how to produce, how to transport. Even now I can see in, in the Arctic region, sun is one factor that is usable also there, even if other energy sources are much more effective. But there are much more sunnier places in, in Europe and the world where it's even more effective. So. We know basically what to do. We just have to speed up permits and also political processes. And we also see that if we are to be resilient, then we have to be connected. We have to produce uh, acceptable energy, which is renewable and sustainable. Uh, and we have to be able to transport that to parts in our own regions and also to other countries. So I have no doubt that we will make that the technique is there, the will is also there, uh, we know what to do, we know what the problems are. Uh, but there is one thing that can make this fail, because regardless of how marvelous energy producing techniques we build or energy transport technique, we have to be able to also protect them. And that's a new threat we can see now when gas pipes are, are being sabotaged and other things. So there's a new dimension to energy safety that we haven't really thought of before. So we also have to be able to protect them in the worst cases of war or other types of crisis. But also regardless that, even if we succeed in all those kind of things, if we don't, if we can't build trust that we will produce energy and export that to the ones who need it, that we will have an open energy market and we will do whatever we can. If we can't build that trust, then all this technology is useless because then it will not gain us, it will not make us create the welfare we all, all need. And that's why I would say this assembly and all political work we do when we meet, when we talk, when we discuss, it's a part of building this trust mm -hmm. that is the base for everything to do. And it's now so really, really important when it comes to creating an energy market for something that everyone in Europe, actually everyone in the world needs. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Darren Jones, who's the chairman of the Select Committee uh, which deals with energy here at the House of Commons. Uh, thank you. Election to start, but given the war in Ukraine, it's reminded us how interdependent all of us are in Europe for energy. 
irrespective of whether we're in the European Union, in EFTA, or indeed in the wider political community. We've seen that for the import of American gas, for our electricity uh, interconnectors, as well as for a reliance on partnerships with Norway and other countries uh, around Europe. Can I thank the officials who put together the recommendation for us on energy? It showed some good progress since we last met uh, in Brussels, um, and it's very comprehensive. And can I welcome the progress that's noted in that recommendation, specifically around the North Sea Energy Cooperation Forum, which we've heard much about today. It also recognizes, of course, that there's further progress to be made uh, urgently on electricity trading arrangements, but also on nuclear, not least in cutting edge nuclear technology, where the UK is investing in, for example, fusion nuclear technologies. But for today's purposes, can I just reflect that during this week of COP27, where our respective governments are currently negotiating our climate commitments um, in Egypt, uh, I hope that both of our governments will be not only um, uh, lodging uh, enhanced nationally determined contributions, but recognizing that the pace uh, that is required must be increased dramatically for the delivery of renewable and clean uh, technologies. And I wonder whether a further action for this group in order to maintain the momentum beyond our recommendation and the progress in the MOU for North Sea Energy Corporation might be in reflecting on our respective governments' pledges at COP27 and identifying the specific projects where the collaboration that could take place between the EU and the UK could be in our mutual benefit as well as to the benefit of the world as part of our collective ambitions to reduce carbon emissions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much. I <laughs> don't know why it's doing that. be all right now. Um, well, that was a, a, a very good contribution. It just made me think, well, perhaps um, the select committee might be interested in pursuing this. And also, of course, the European uh, Parliament also has a, a committee which, um, which deals with energy. So perhaps both of them could, could, could help us uh, to pursue this agenda even more uh, firmly than we already are doing, which is quite firmly. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Marco Campo Menosi. Uh, I either pronounced it so badly that um, Mr. Campo Menosi <laughs> didn't uh, hear, or I think he may not be here. In which case, um, I don't know if Chris McManus wants to come in on this one. hadn't indicated, but uh, as the only left voice in the room, uh, it would probably fell towards me. Um, obviously, quite a lot of the, the left group, my apologies to my colleagues in the Social Democrats, uh, who were on our broad left. Uh, but uh, quite a number of the points have already been well made by, uh, by previous speakers in regards to cooperation uh, and the need for more renewables, and, and that's the way that ne needs to be accelerated. So. Uh, I, as I said, won't take up too much more time because I'm conscious there's approximately 20 minutes left, but to say I'm supportive of, of many of the sentiments already expressed. Well, thank you very much. And um, it said on my speaker's list, um, if requested, so I, w I thought I'd give you the chance anyway. Um, so the next, um, uh, the next speaker uh, would be Lord Ricketts. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Chairman. And I suppose I should declare an interest that I'm a, on the board of NG, um, energy company, while well, I'm not speaking for them here. And what a pleasure to be talking about something a bit more positive, where cooperation is the watchword all round. Um, three quick points for me. First of all, a point hasn't quite been stressed yet, the strategic importance of what is happening in Europe to wean European countries off dependence on Russian gas. I mean, that is breaking um, a blackmail, um, a leverage that um, Vladimir Putin has had over Europe, and although there is pain in the short term, the strategic gain in the longer term is really significant um, as a contribution to autonomy, uh, European autonomy, including the UK. Um, secondly, uh, the UK wasn't dependent on Russian gas, but we've discovered that we are not an island for energy, that it is absolutely critical uh, that we cooperate with other European partners. We are directly affected by prices uh, elsewhere in Europe and the world, um, and an interconnected diverse um, energy supply is a resilient uh, market for all of us. 
And so I welcome the um, proposed recommendation, which stresses all the way through the importance of coordination, of more interconnectors, uh, of more cooperation. I think that's absolutely right. Um, and thirdly, while I think we're quite well set for this coming winter, that our stocks are high of gas, the following winter may be more difficult. Um, and that depends a lot on demand in Asia. If that picks up, we're going to find that uh, GNL gets much more expensive. And it seems to me vital that we don't compete against each other <coughs> in global markets for the same energy. Um, my only other concern is exactly what a previous speaker has suggested, the vulnerability of our networks to sabotage. We saw with the Nord Stream uh, sabotage uh, that that is a real risk. Uh, it's something for NATO, but I'm sure it's also something for the EU and the UK to be working on together. So the more active cooperation in this area, the better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, I think it is worth just noting that we have been cooperating um, within uh, Europe to sort out the short-term issue of this winter. And uh, Britain's obviously helped with the uh, docking and passing on of uh, liquid petroleum gas where we have more um, ports that can cope with it and so on. Uh, the next speaker is Anna Fotiga. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I, of course, commend uh, any effort uh, uh, mitigating the, the effects of, of uh, Russian energy war against uh, whole, not only Ukraine, but the whole West. We have to remember that what we do now quite hastily is uh, to mitigate effects of, of uh, uh, a very wrong policies for decades, and we have to do it quickly, because surely Ukraine is one of the first victims of this. And uh, it's not only energy prices uh, uh, to our uh, citizens, both uh, EU member states and UK, uh, but uh, in particular high energy prices and still ability for Russia to gain revenues from su supplying uh, source energy hydrocarbons uh, is to finance each of over 200 days of, of uh, uh, invasion and enormous atrocities happening. So we have to act quickly we have to, to, to ensure quick limiting of, of, of uh, absorption of, of Russian hydrocarbons and uh, limit possibility to raise energy prices. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Colm Markey. Thank you very much, Chair. A, a key part of our, our energy future is, if you like, the interplay between wind and solar. If you like, in the northwest of Europe, where the, the wind blows, the, indeed in the UK and the northwest of Europe, the wind blows, whereas in the south, we have major solar potential. And when you look at the figures, it's quite remarkable how one compensates for the other. Essentially, when it's stormy, the wind blows in the northwest of Europe, and, and it's not sunny. But when it's sunny in the south of Europe, the, the wind isn't blowing in the northwest. So the, the one, one compensates for the other. And I think a key thing that we need to focus in terms of that energy potential of both wind and, wind and solar is a super grid that allows one to compensate for the other across the whole of Europe. That includes the UK and, if you like, the EU as a whole. And I would say, if you look at that in the context of the level of interconnection we have at the moment, where the, inter the Celtic interconnector from Ireland to France is talked about to be less than one gigawatt of power. And the current ambition of the Irish government off the west coast of Ireland is 30 gigawatts of power. So the scale of interconnection and grid capacity we need to, to deliver on this is, is quite remarkable. And for some, the, 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 the solution is hydrogen. But bearing in mind, even with a hydrogen cell, you only get 30% efficiency. And if you burn hydrogen, it, hydrogen, it's even lower. So really, the need, more than anything, I believe, for an interconnector or a grid, should I say, across the whole of Europe is vital. And I think the cost involved of perhaps 2.3 mil billion is something that we exercise all our minds to deliver something of that nature. Quite, quite simply, 
it's not an option that, that we have. We just need to cooperate in this area. And delivering that grid could be part of our energy is secure future and would be ensuring that it was done through renewable energy. So like others have said, cooperation in this matter is, one, is the positive story here and the potential is enormous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our last speaker from the floor will be uh, Svetlina Pinkova, who of course is our vice chair. And I'll ask uh, Natalie Guazo if she wants to make any comment and then we'll see if uh, we can connect, connect again with Mr. Pettersson and uh, have a final word from him before we go on to the recommendation. So it's uh, Svetlina Penkova. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So uh, many things have already been um, said and communicated. I think uh, if we have to summarize what is the situation with the energy market now, uh, both for the UK and for the EU, is like, first of all, we need energy independence. And second of all, we need a stable energy mix within each one of our economies. To guarantee a stable energy mix, we still need to have base load power. Uh, by traditional definitions, unfortunately, that includes some of, the, some of the fossil energy sources up until now. And here is the question, how are we going to make the transition and which one is the least uh, low carbon one of those base energy fuels that we can actually use for, the, uh, for, for our energy mix of the future. I don't think there is a doubt, but in the long term, uh, both uh, EU and the, uh, and the United Kingdom have the very uh, strong ambitions to invest in renewables, and that's the main path forward. We've mentioned twin, we've mentioned solar, the hydrogen, but the green hydrogen is also under development. Uh, but uh, the, the matter of nuclear and the nuclear power has also been mentioned many times in this room now. And we shouldn't be ignoring the fact that the United Kingdom is doing like quite a significant uh, development in terms of the nuclear energy development, especially when it comes to small modular reactors. It's probably going to be the first European country to come out with the license SMR that are going to be available for the European market. And we should be aware of that. Uh, having said all that, uh, here comes the question which also has been mentioned in the previous sessions about the divergence between the regulations in the EU and the UK, which especially when it comes to the energy matters, I think it might be getting a bit more complex and complicated. And I'm just going to give one example here. Uh, United Kingdom left Euroatom, the, nuclear, the European Nuclear Energy um, Association for Nuclear Energy. You can imagine that this creates a lot of burdens if we want to cooperate on that matter in the future. So I just want to raise the attention when we're speaking about the future cooperation on renewables, because it's going to involve a lot of data sharing, a lot of technological developments, to not be that strong on the matter that we should be Di diverging or having different regulations on those aspects. Because keep in mind that we're starting from the same standing point now, from the same standards. And once we start, start diverging, it doesn't matter whose standards are better. It's going to matter that they're going to be different, which could create problems for the future cooperation and exchange of ideas, exchange of technologies. Just wanted to put that on the table because I think it's a significant point in our further conversations from, uh, from that point on, on any aspect, but especially on energy now, which is crucial for our uh, stability of our economy. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I'll now ask uh, Natalie Loiseau uh, in case she wishes to comment. Oui, merci beaucoup, Oliver. Um, Thank you very much, Oliver. When you suggested that we talk about energy in the first meeting of the Parliamentary Assembly, I think that you are quite prophetic in a way when you see the way in which uh, power stations now figure high on the list of priorities both of our citizens and indeed of governments. The war in Ukraine isn't just happening out in the field. The soldiers and citizens of Ukraine have shown enormous courage, but 
on other fronts, we're divided by a type of hybrid war which has been discouraging us from supporting Ukraine. And within this hybrid war, energy is a major weapon. We have to be able to stand united. Resisting this blackmail, which is quite unjustified. When you're an island, an energy crisis brings with it both opportunities and disadvantages. Opportunities because the UK has invested enormously in offshore wind. This is something which we should follow in the European Union. All too often our decision-making processes are simply too slow. But we know there are difficulties in terms of connection. And from that point of view, it's easier to be uh, on the European continent, which means it's far easier to change, trade, swap gas and electricity between member states. It's very much in our interest to step up our cooperation, to set aside the way we've thought in the past, and I think all of us are guilty of this, in my own country, we know that the main electricity producer is very much set in its ways. And all too often that holds us back when it comes to exploring new possibilities in terms of interconnection. And I'm sure that applies in many other countries as well. This means it's up to us as politicians to push hard, to seek more creative approaches when it comes to using renewable energy, nuclear energy, and to ensure that we no, long, no longer need to depend at all on energy coming from Russia. Moreover, we must also ensure that we can provide our citizens with the energy they want, that's to say, energy at a reasonable price for households and businesses. So we need to continue to explore the options open to us despite the difficulties of Brexit, despite geographical differences, despite different policy choices, all of us should be able to work together with the decisions we take. Still there, uh, would he like the final word? Thank you so much, Chair. I hope I'm coming through. Um, and, and thanks for all these uh, great remarks that I would uh, subscribe to personally uh, in, 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 in so many ways. Just if you would allow me, just a couple of reflections on, on what was uh, being put forward. Uh, now, now uh, the first intervention emphasized uh, the, the industrial perspectives also in, in further deployment of renewables that uh, we're able to fulfill our climate objectives as well as ensuring further job creation and and uh, and, and adding to 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 economic growth in this. Uh, so there, there's so much to be said for of renewables uh, apart from the obvious strategic gains, as was mentioned, in terms of of ensuring that we decrease our dependency on. On, on Russian gas. So, but the point on the industrial perspectives in, in this is, is really worth uh, remembering, given that Europe at large is world leader in offshore renewables. And in order to remain world leaders, uh, for sure, we need to uh, further invest uh, in, in this interesting uh, field. Again, North Sea uh, has tremendous potential that we should uh, exploit to, uh, to the fullest. And, and finally, I think it's it's uh, it's worth mentioning also that that there is some sort of different say policy approach to to renewables now uh, that that renewables are more to be seen in public as being of public interest as being of strategic interest in the entire security light uh, given the uh, the need for further autonomy and and lessening of dependency on on Russian gas imports. So, uh, there's a new approach. Should be a new approach to uh, this deployment of renewables. And for sure, this only requires even further cooperation than what we've managed to do so far. So let me thank you so much for all these interesting observations. I think there's so much solid ground 
uh, to cover here in, in ensuring further cooperation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you also for supporting us in uh, uh, coming back into uh, cooperation with the North Sea Energy Group, uh, cooperative group. I mean, that is something that's uh, a solid achievement and uh, uh, something which the Assembly supported and which you were an early supporter of. So thank you for, for speaking and uh, it's been very, uh, very good discussion, I think, and you've played an important part in it. Thank you very much. Now, when this has been done, which it has, we have the adoption of recommendation to Partnership Council. Now, this is the first use of our powers, uh, which we gained at the last meeting, and um, we come to consideration of the recommendation. It only requires the support of a simple majority in each delegation in order to be adopted. And perhaps I could start with the EP delegation and ask members to raise their hands if they're in favour of the recommendation. Uh, anyone against? No, well that's a, a, a very clear <laughs> unanimous decision from the EP uh, delegation. And now we come to the uh, delegation from the UK uh, Parliament. Uh, all those in favour? And is there anyone against? Oh, what a fantastic <laughs> arrangement that was. Uh, well, uh, therefore, I, I think we can say that the recommendation has received the support of the majority of both delegations and is therefore agreed. A moment of history. After this impressive vote, I think we should ask to be uh, given a few other more sensitive topics from our common agendas and we would be able to sort out a number of issues. Uh, now a few housekeeping remarks and I will turn back to French. Voilà qui conclut nos travaux en plénière pour So that completes our work in the plenary today. I'm sure you'll agree that we've had some very interesting discussions. We would like to invite members now to go to the, com the rooms in which they'll be in the breakout group, Citizens' Rights, Artists on Tour, and Cyber Defense and uh, Data Exchanges. The discussion group should start at 4.30. In the meantime, coffee has been room served in the room, so I suggest that members go to their rooms immediately where the coffee's waiting for you. I'll certainly be going there. I would also like to remind members that they are cordially invited to a dinner hosted by the uh, Parliament at 7 p.m. It's that's on an inv invite invite only, and British Parliament, the UK Parliament staff will escort you to the dinner. We'll be meeting again tomorrow at 9:30 in this same committee room, and we'll start by addressing all the points which the participants have uh, raised. And I look forward very much to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, uh, can I just announce the rooms? 